Hello and welcome to Chimera, Britain's only book festival celebrating science fiction, fantasy and horror writing. My name is Anne Landman and I'm the festival's founder and artistic director. Right about now I hope to be welcoming you to beautiful Edinburgh, to our venue The Pleasance, for a weekend packed with events. Writing workshop panels, readings, open mics, a quiz, a Kaylee, two plays, we had so much in store for you. Thank you for joining us online instead to be part of our programme from the safety of your homes. We are very excited to still bring you a fantastic lineup of speakers. We'd ask you that you support our speakers, and there's many ways you can do that. You can buy their books or borrow them from the library. You can donate to them directly via their Patreon or Coffee. You will find the links for that below in the description. We encourage you to buy a ticket for our events, even the pre-recorded ones. All ticket money will go directly to our speakers. You can also donate to the festival and all donations via the donation page will be split between our speakers once we've covered our costs like the Zoom account. Thank you again for joining us in this brave new world of digital events. We hope you have a chance to check out all 33 of ours over the weekend. Please let us know what you think of them. Do get in touch via social media the chat function in Zoom, or drop us an email on info at chimerafestival.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you have a fantastic weekend, and we look forward to seeing you in person next year for Chimera 2021. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this Chimera event with Trudy Canavan and Mayor Lewis. Before we come to the main event, we have a special event for you that is a Brave New Words reading. Brave New Words is an initiative that Kenya runs for emerging writers, right here in Scotland. And our first one for today is M.E. Rodman. M.E. Rodman writes LGBTQ plus fantasy with a dark edge and occasional stories of horror and the uncanny. Their short fiction has appeared in various anthologies and today they are reading from their debut novel, Blood and Thorn. So please put your hands together wherever you are for M. E. Rotman. Hi, um, so I'm going to read a short extract from this, my debut novel, um, Blood and Thought, which is available from Amazon and my publisher, Crystal Link Publishing. Okay. Janda, eighth day, month of the salt moon, the Chalu Plains, unoccupied lands, 972. The city lay in shadow and snow. If he squinted, Janda could just catch the light glint of light on the metal spires of its towers and the glow of the dying sun in its windows of glass. It was so close, less than a day's ride away. Whirlwind shifted her weight against him and sighed heavily. The mare had grown bored and cold, standing there watching him gaze into the distance and Janda didn't blame her. The bulge of city walls with the shadow of the mountain meant nothing to a horse from the plains. As if to emphasise this, she tossed her head, nudging his shoulder more insistently and he patted the blanket that covered her flank. They couldn't leave yet. He strained his eyes in the darkness, hunching over as if that would send his sight farther. The nag yaga, the plains wind, which at this time of year often held his sudden snowstorms, grabbed at his hair. He should have been excited, relieved even, but all he really felt was sick. Behind him, tucked away from the white crest of a hill, a campfire burned bright in the frosted air and a hide in a slung over the boughs of bent thorns offered a warm bed for the night, but he wasn't ready for sleep. He wasn't ready to leave the fading light on the spires. 21 years. Time enough for a boy to grow to manhood, for a man to atone for his crimes, for an imperial to become a hunter of the clans. What am I going back to? Your own people? Your own world? He looked up into the darkening sky. It was clear and chill with the promise of more snow and the full white moon burned fierce against the sleeping, the deepening blue. In its wake, there seemed to be a million stars. 21 years ago, he'd been a frightened boy standing in the imperial judgment circle, his head shorn in shame, struggling not to cry as he awaited a formal sentence from the Emperor's own lips. He'd lost a life then, and now he was losing another. He closed his eyes, but behind their lids he could still see the carpet of sky stars burning overhead. There were no stars in the skies above the Imperial Palace, not where the bright lights of civilization burn night and day. There's no place to be alone in the dark there. It is a different world. Once he would have given his life's blood to be able to turn south and make his way back to the world of his birth. Whirlwind Wicked and Jandar swallowed a rueful laugh, patting the man again absentmindedly, shaking himself as if to clear the doubt from his head. He stamped his feet to take the numbness from his toes. The hiss of footsteps through frosted grass, loud in the stillness of nightfall, made him turn. 
gift strode towards him through the thorn copse that guarded the crest of the hill. Her face was grave, but her brown eyes smiled, and Janda, as always, couldn't resist smiling in return. He'd said farewell to the others of his clan in the winter grazing grounds. They'd slaughtered goats, drunk too much spiced mead, and danced until the moon set. Only his daughter had come south with him. You found your road? Janda nodded. In the way of the plains peoples, where one word had many meanings, Gif was asking after his travel plans, his greater destiny, and his desire. I see the way, he replied. The exchange of comment was almost a ritual. Gif smiled soft. We always knew you must go one day. Janda closed his eyes and voiced his thoughts out loud. But does it have to be tomorrow? Father, Gif laughed. You said yourself that it must be. True, but he hesitated. The south is so far away. Gif moved forward in the easy loping way, throwing her arms about Janda's shoulders and hugging him close. Oh, my father, she said. Janda turned to watch his daughter's face and she looked past his shoulder towards a distant city, the moonlight bathing her brown skin with shadows of silver. He saw the sorrow in her dark, common eyes, even as she resolutely blinked it away. My child. You must miss them, Gif said softly. Your own people? Janda did not drop his gaze from her face, marking the softness of her cheek and the curve of her earlobe and a thousand other things that were hers and hers alone, and yet somehow as familiar to Janda as his own skin. Do I miss them? After all this time, they will have changed. I might not even know them, but then I've changed too, Janda swallowed. I don't know. <coughs> Gif turned at him. I looked at him. I miss you already, she whispered. He turned his face away. He'd been a child when he came to the plains, alone, ashamed, afraid. The people of the clans had given him a place among them, a sure and constant of changing the seasons of the moons, Janda stood down his gloved hands. He did not need to see the heavy calluses that were his palms and the thin, silvery scars from the time when whirlwind dumped him into a thorn copse. He did not need to see the skin on their backs, as dark as rich loam. He wore the hawk mark of his clan in ink across his wrists and wore his black hair in the braids of a clan bachelor, their ends fastened by copper beads etched with spirit wards. He was windblown as summer grasses and as weathered as the old roads through the grasslands that led nowhere. Janda sighed, reaching out to grasp his daughter's shoulders, ignoring her lowered head. You are my people, he said softly, fiercely. Gif lifted her head, looking for all the world like a child again, not a grown woman of more than 20 summers. I am? Janda's grip tightened. Always. Gif drew out a slow smile, though it did not reach her eyes. Janda smiled in return and pulled his daughter close, holding her tight against his chest. They left the crest of the hill, turning away from the distant lights of the city. Well, when wicked as she went to join two flecks, Gif scalding on the side of the hill. Leaving the horses to their grazing, Gif led Janda to the fire and placed a cup of hot milky tea in his hand. It warmed his chill fingers, the steam heating his face. They didn't talk much. There were too many words, and none of them were enough. Thank you very much, Emmy Rotman. No problem. And we will now hand you over to Maria Lewis for our main act. Thank you very much. Maria Lewis, award-winning, uh, best-selling author um, of fantasy and spec fic. I'm a screenwriter and a journalist, and uh, I'm going to be diving in deep into Trudy's body of work, some of her inspirations, her new book, uh, how you finish off trilogies and series and epic sagas that's something that i really want to get into but before we get started and just fyi my laptop with questions is on my lap so in case you're wondering why i keep like looking down at my knees that's why <laughs> um before we get started i just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which trudy and i meet today uh, whose sovereignty was never ceded the aboriginal elders past present and future now, before we get into the nitty gritty of what we're talking about today, I just want to, for anyone who might just be tuning in for the first time, obviously I'm assuming that you're here because you're a big fan of Trudy's work and you're a big fan of spec fic and fantasy and swords and sorcery and all that kind of stuff. But just in case you're not familiar, she's an award-winning, globally published, best-selling author of several fantasy series, including, but not limited to, the Black Magician Trilogy, Traitor Spy Trilogy, Age of the Five Trilogy, and her latest book, Maker's Curse, which is the much anticipated conclusion to the Millennium's Rule series. Welcome, Trudy. Thank you. <laughs> now, before we get into book stuff, I just wanted to quickly ask, how are you, how are you doing amid this global pandemic? What things have you been, you know, doing to cope? You're a writer, so the immediate assumption is that we're good at working from home, but that's not always the case. So how have you been dealing with it all? Um. Not much has changed, but I hadn't realised how much I do go out because I do work from home. And I've always said that I'm 90% hermit and 10% social party animal. Yeah. So 
90% of the time I'm fine. And then every now and then I get, mm, I wish I could have people over and have cocktails. You know? Yeah, it is. It is that interesting thing too. Cause I th like, I um, have to be a extrovert for work, but so like a professional extrovert, but I would say I'm a personal introvert. So thriving yeah. most of the time, just, you know, being at home or with a small group of people. And, um, but yeah, it is little things that you, like just tiny little things like small house parties and, you know, stuff like that. They really take for granted, but, um, you know, hopefully we're all safe and semi sanish and sanitized. <laughs> now we've got um, 50 minutes to dive into everything. And so that's a chunk of time. And if you have questions for Trudy or myself, you can ask those questions and they pop up in a little Q and A box so we can see them and we can get to those questions at the end. So as we're talking, if you're watching this and there's something that you want to ask Trudy, ask myself, you can ask it immediately and we will get to it at the end of the sesh. But I want to go back Trudy, right to the very beginning, <laughs> back to when you're a wee kid, I was watching some old interviews with you and reading some old interviews that you've done. Um, yeah, I was like trying to like have a scope, you know what I mean? Cause your perspective changes as a writer, the longer you've been in the game and you know, things change and you learn more and you grow wiser and all that kind of stuff. But what I was very interested to read was that, um, in these interviews, it said that when you're a kid, you wanted to make movies. Like that was, was your dream. That was the thing that you wanted to do before eventually pursuing a career as an artist and a designer and a writer. And that really struck me because your books are very cinematic. Like when you read them, you can't help be sucked into that world. And I was wondering, do you feel like your love of the film medium helped influence your novels in terms of like scale and scope, that kind of thing? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, probably as much as books did. Mm. Um, but I'm definitely a visual person. When I mean, it all started with Star Wars. Um, and I, when I saw The Empire Strikes Back, I went to school and I, you know, at lunchtime, I went down to the back of the, the school and started hooning around pretending to be a TIE fighter like all the boys did. They thought I was very cool. And I remember thinking that I wanted to be a movie maker. But I know when I, I do distinctly remember mentioning this to an adult, I don't remember who it was, whether it was a teacher or yeah, you know, many of the other adults that were influenced on me at the time. And they said, why don't you write your ideas down? And they said, it's a very difficult industry to get into. So start writing your ideas down. And I was probably drawing more than I was writing initially. Mm. So it sort of started off that way. And then when I read Lord of the Rings at 14, it really became more of a, um, more of a writing thing. So it's, it's interesting because I, I did have to work at becoming a writer. It didn't, it wasn't something I just emerged into. I think I probably started off as in a visual medium to, to actually get it into a, a word medium. I had to really work at it initially. Um, and then once I, I sort of got it, I remember there was one stage there where I realized that writing wasn't a visual medium as such. You can write visually. It's actually an oral medium. It's actually had the word sound and the, the rhythm of it and the, the, um, the pace, the, all that sort of stuff's got more to do with, sound and you know music and etc uh, than it does with an oral but with a visual medium which is basically a frame one picture is a frame so and movies of course would would blend that, that together perfectly wouldn't it with the sound and vision and pace and all that sort of stuff so yeah have you ever because you are very visually orientated and you have that artist background as well have you ever thought about graphic novels is that something that you've been interested in like telling an original story through that medium i have and two things have stopped me the first one was i tried it once and it's a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a, yeah oh yeah and then um and i was it was always sort of in the back of my mind that one day maybe if i you know had an idea that was just perfect for a graphic novel i would try this but I've been going to the Supernova, which is like Australian's comic, Australia's Comic Con. It's like a, a big thing. Like and, and I was going to those as an author and I was meeting comic book artists and totally humbled by their skill. I mean, those guys are amazing. Uh, literally, it's sort of big where they, there's one guy, um, gosh, I can't remember his name now, but he, I, I'd say to him, he'd be sitting there drawing every moment that he had spare. And I and I'd say, what are you drawing? He said, oh, people just request that I draw something for them. You know, I'd say, so if I said that you want, could you draw me an aardvark? Could you just draw it? And he said, yes. And I said, I would need a photographic reference. 
he has it all in his head somehow. <laughs> so those two things have kind of made me realise that while it would be fantastically fun to do that, it's not the specific area that I think I could actually succeed in because there's so many people doing it better than me. Yeah, but and to, to be fair, I mean, some of the uh, some of my personal favourite graphic novels, the things that decorate my walls in my life, aren't necessarily the things that would hang in the Louvre per se, but it's that storyteller's oh, no. unique voice and the way they tell the story. Yeah, but the, I don't, don't, don't put the comic book artist's um, gift down. It is a skill and it's, mm. I mean, I can do a realistic painting, but I can't draw what they draw. And, and I'm totally in awe of their skill. It is uh, something that should never be devalued because it is really, it's a skill that they've obviously practiced for many, many years and dedicated a lot of time to. So I have as much respect for that as I have painting in the Louvre. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's my Louvre. DC Comics, Marvel, that's my Louvre. Um, so are books as successful as yours, I'm sure people are always asking the question, you know, what about option agreements? When can we see the movie next week? That kind of thing. <laughs> but this this process development takes a long time and out of all your novels and short stories i was curious as to which one do you think would be prime for adaptation like is there a particular story that is, that's the one that you think would work really well as a television show or a film i still think the black magician trilogy would be the best um because there'd be limited amount of special effects it's actually mostly done indoors and they say this is what, what's great about crime series is they're actually quite cheap to film. They're mostly indoors. The outdoor stuff is not grand and you don't need much in the way of special effects to do them. So the special effects would be, there would definitely be moments in there where they, they would be great. But it'd actually be a rather cheap series to make and it's all character based and it's all tension and, and pacing. So that's what I think they should start with. And I've had, from time to time, I've had interest. And even... Um, Earlier this year, I had interest from someone wanting to perhaps do a Netflix series. And then COVID-19 happened. It's always something has made it fizzle out. But apparently that's quite normal. But, yeah, you know. no, very extremely, extremely normal. Um, I was working on two live action television shows just before COVID hit. And both of them ceased production. And then <laughs> I got rehired on two animated shows. Because obviously animation is something that you don't need to do a physical shoot for that. It can just immediately go. So it is one of those weird things where shows that are sort of sitting in a, or shows or films that are sitting in a holding pattern and then weird outside circumstances they have no control over end yep. up being the thing yep. that um, make it go. But I mean, as an author, you are in control of your stories. You're in control of the world, your control of the arc, the narrative, where it's going, how it's going, how quickly you're going to get there. Does that scare you a little bit, the idea of somebody else, whether that's a showrunner or a producer or a director, taking over your characters and, and being in charge of your world after you've been in charge of it for so long? Not really. I mean, I, of course you want it to be good and you want it to be ke keeping the key things that make the readers, you know, love the series. So you want, but these days... It's not as bad as it was back in the 70s and 80s where they would just take a concept or just a title and, and run with it and we wouldn't barely resemble the original book. Um, these days they are pretty good at keeping the essence of the story, even if they take it a totally new direction, like with the, um, the True Blood series. Uh, I, I couldn't say with Game of Thrones because I've never read it, but... Um, if they keep yeah, that... The first, the first it, few it, seasons of Game of Thrones are pretty close to the book and then... Brrr, yeah. Sometimes when they divert, they actually still do a great thing. I, I mean, I, I love the True Blood books, but I also love the um, the TV series. And they yeah, same. Different. I'm a massive fan of both. And that's like Lafayette is one of the best things about the TV series. And he's dead by the start of book yeah. two. But <laughs> yeah, different things work in different mediums as long as you're staying true to the theme and tone of the, the source material. The one thing I thought... Um, if the Black Mission trilogy was signed up now, I'd be tempted not to write any more in the series because um, I think I'd, I'd probably give them my ideas for future things and just say, go with it because mm. I would be entertained. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it is interesting as well because it, like the whole, you know, the way shows are made now is you have writer's rooms and it's hiring lots of different creatives and lots of different types of people from ty different types of backgrounds 
to try and come up with the best possible ideas and all work together to try and create a thing and solidify the thing that already exists on the page, whether it's a comic or a book or, you know, a podcast series or something like that, which is really exciting. And sometimes you get some incredible shows from that, some very addictive shows. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about Maker's Curse, obviously, which is your latest book. So congratulations. It's only been out for a month. Is that right? Ah, uh, here's when you prepared uh, earlier. Three quarters of a month? Something like that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Yay! Um, <laughs> now I know obviously you have a lot of books and a lot of short stories, but every new book is a book baby and you need to celebrate <laughs> and take a moment to like pop the champers per se. Um, have you oh, done yeah. anything to celebrate? Uh, nothing huge, as in no big party, no obviously no launches. They have to I mean, nothing isolation like celebrate, <laughs> play Monopoly. <laughs> I don't know. But my, my publisher sent me a lovely hamper, and um, we had a bottle of wine and lots of lovely, you know, yummy things to eat. So we sort of sat and had a little celebration dinner, like a little pre-dinner dinner sort of thing. So yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's, it's I've had a lot of publicity I wasn't expecting because of all the Zoom. Um, and other kinds of like Instagram live and things like that. That medium has meant that I've done a whole lot of stuff that wasn't on the schedule, which mm. has been fabulous. Like, yeah. um, like I was saying earlier, um, we get a chance to actually take part in something like this festival um, where we wouldn't normally be invited because, you know, it costs we a lot of money. We live in the over the world. <laughs> <laughs> we live in the sunny side of the world. <laughs> Yeah, we live very far away from everything. Like, if there was a writer's festival in Antarctica, we'd get invited all the time. But, you know, it's expensive yeah. to, to get us out there. Yeah. So I can, I've been able to participate in a lot of things that I wouldn't normally. Um, I did a, a, an Orbit Live, uh, Orbit Tavern, who a publisher has, uh, Lauren Palapatino, uh, one of the creative directors over in the US. And I had to get up at 6.30 in the morning because we, we did it at 7 in the morning. So I was there. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I got to make a cocktail with them um, at the same time as Lauren and that was great fun so yeah. these things that I would never normally be a part of it's just great to be invited and, and joining in so I'm, I'm really enjoying that and how have you felt so has that been a weird experience doing a, a book launch digitally because obviously you know in the age of blogs and websites we do do it when you have a new book come out you do a lot of interviews or a lot of QAs via email or vice versa so that doesn't necessarily change but have you found the like the digital launch thing quite different or difficult to adjust to um I think probably I mean I'm really enjoying this is this is entirely new an actual live interview um <laughs> yeah. Yeah, usually I'd say the first it's thing that set actually... on fire soon I can just feel it like it's going too well <laughs> Either your background is like going to spring to life or there's a cat under a book or something behind me is going to catch on fire. That's, I'm, I'm extremely worried. <laughs> um, so yeah, normally I might get a few requests for me to record myself on video, but the, in the past it's been, I got really stressed about that because there's an obligation for it to be really good video. <laughs> and what I love about this is everything now is like, oh, just take it on your mobile phone. It's selfie quality is fine. I'm like, Great. I don't have to be an expert because usually the hardest thing I found was to actually get the sound right. Mm. Uh, we, we have a, a, a photographer. So we have the lighting. Like I've got a big special lighting light up here. So you know, with the right, light's coming the right side and all the, everything's right. But we don't know anything about how to um, sound up. You know, we don't have the right microphones and things like that. So quite often in the past, I would do these really slick things, but the sound was terrible. So there's no pressure now. It's like, just take a picture on yourself, if, you know, on your phone. Take videos, ask, you know, answer questions on your phone. It's like, okay, I can do that. Yeah, and I also think that people's general attitudes as well, um, obviously the exception of everything that's going on politically right now, but generally before that, it feels like everyone's a little bit nicer. You know, everyone's taking a little bit longer to reply to things and people are like, it's cool. Take your time. Mm. Reply when you can, you know. Oh, there's no audio. It doesn't matter. We'll figure it out. Everyone's yeah. being a little bit um, soft around the edges, which is nice. Yeah, every video I've done, there's been a cat bombing and it's been <laughs> fabulous. Everyone's like, ah, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Yeah. yeah, well, that's an added prop. That's a living prop, so that works. Um, now, because Maker's Curse has just come out, for people who are watching who may be a little bit worried that we're going to dip into spoilers, 
I'm going to try and keep it quite broad. So for people who haven't read the book, don't worry. You don't need to tune out or like la la la. Um, we're not going to be going into anything because this is like anything spoilery. This is a spoiler free zone, even though it is the end of the series. Um, but like, we're just going to be talking broadly about stuff rather than what happens on page 96 specifically. But, Anyway, <laughs> as mentioned, um, this is the fourth and final chapter in the Millennium's Rule series. And I'm really curious because you have completed a lot of series, right? You've got a lot of trilogies. And I was wondering, because you have that experience under your belt of completing multiple trilogies, do you feel like because you had that, like because you've done that many times, do you feel like that gave you an advantage when it came to Maker's Curse because you knew how to wrap up like an epic saga? Oh, uh, Maker's Curse is a completely different beast to the series I've written before. In the Black Magician trilogy, I intended it to be one book. And then after I'd written it, I looked at it and it's got these obvious sort of minor conclusions at, at one third and two thirds the way through. And so I then broke it up into three and then rewrote them. Um, and then when it came to the sequel trilogy, it, you know, it was obvious it needed to follow the same pattern. And, and so I consciously plotted it out to be like that. The Age of the Five, it just sort of wanted to be a trilogy again. Um, and at that point, I think I realised that I kind of had sort of a structure that I was following in all of them. And it could be quite different stories, but there is sort of that first book which introduces you to the characters and, and to the threat and the puzzle that's, you know, we say the books are made up of three things, the romance, the, uh, the quest or puzzle, and the... Oh, <laughs> yeah, I forgot what the third one is. It's eight o'clock at night, I have two glasses of wine. Um, we need more yeah, wine. Then, so there's, there's the main, there's the threat, that's it, the threat, the puzzle, or the quest, and the, um, the romance, and those three things. And the romance doesn't have to be an actual romance, like a romance novel where it's got to be um, mm. a happy ending. Mm. It, it could be two or three romances, you know, Nothing in life says that the first romance you ever had is the, is the one that actually works. So I like to follow that yeah, as well. Yes. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> so I realised that I had structure. And the second book was usually more about the puzzle. So it was more about figuring out who the enemy was, how they could be fought, all that sort of thing. And the third book was usually the, it's the culmination of everything in the, the first and second books. It's a big confrontation. It's, you know, the conclusion to everything. The Maker's Curse is actually a series of almost standalone books. They are, there is an overarching plot, but the, the, the story within each one is more independent than all the previous series books I've ever written have been. Obviously, The Magician's Apprentice, which was the standalone prequel, was just a standalone book. But I even found when I was writing that, even though it's got five parts, I was still following that same pattern. Um, but the Maker's, maker's um, the Millions Rule books uh, don't follow that pattern necessarily in the same way. They are an evolving story. Yeah, did you, like, because a trilogy on paper, a lot, like, so you were talking about three-act structure a lot, not just for films, but for most forms of modern storytelling, they do follow the three-act structure. But a quartet, obviously, is different. And do you find that keeping each of the books in the series, the Millennium's Rule series, did you find that helped by having them be a little bit more self-contained because it wasn't necessarily following a three act structure? Like, was that in your mind at all or was it just like that made the most sense for the kind of story that you were trying to tell? Probably the latter, it made the most sense for the sort of story I was trying to tell. Um, mm. And as far, in the story, there's sort of five years between what happens in each one. So there's kind of the, the conflict is resolved. The conflict for each book is resolved, but there's an overarching thing that's sort of happening in the background that links them together. Mm. So you, you probably could read each book separately, but you'd miss that background arc. You'd miss that thread going mm. through. Because the thread is actually the mystery, the, the puzzle that you've got to fix, figure out. Yeah, the little Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's Marvel it. movies, you know, you can enjoy each of them separately, but if you've watched all of them, you get treats. Um, besides yeah. Chris Hemsworth. Um <laughs> <laughs> did you did you find that when you were writing a, a book series where there is a gap between a, a gap of time, right? A gap of chronology between each of the books. 
did you find that difficult in terms of things that you had to chart, like what happened in the five years between? Was that, like, did you have meticulous documents is what I'm trying to get to. Did you have like a serial killer board in your house with yarn and pins and all sorts of stuff <laughs> trying to work out, okay, this is what happened in that five years and then the next five years, are, yep, round the two, carry by three, divide by, yep. Um, not really, because I think because I'm winding it up in each book, Main, the main plot, the main conflict in each books. The interim is usually, it's almost a rest period. Mm. It's like not necessarily jumping from one exciting, you know, part of your life into the next. It's not like out of the frying pan into the fire or anything like that. So things are resolved. People settled into wherever they were, or you know, they went in, into hiding, or you know, they made it, made themselves a, a new home in a new world or anything like that, and they sort of settle. And then life comes and knocks them off the perch again. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of not hard to do that with when you have these intended breaks. It's actually kind of good in some ways because um, there's not that expectation of relentless action. And yeah. I, I sort of call these parts in, a, in writing, um, I call them the, uh, they're sort of like the, uh, I'm trying to think it's, it's an artistic term. It's the negative space. I think yeah. in white space. I think in myself, white noise, but no, there's a negative space. In, in art, um, you may have a picture of something and, and all of the, say so you've got a picture of a flower and all around it is actually the negative space. It's the space that's not as relevant as the main subject, but it's important because if it's not there, it doesn't, you don't have the, you know, if it was something else there, it would distract from the thing you're trying to uh, focus on. So in writing, all those little pauses between chapters or parts or books, they're negative space. And they're actually as valuable as, as, an, as a nothing space as the real story is. It's, the, the breaks are sometimes as important to the plot. Yeah, and do you find that the negative space does end up becoming inspiration in a way in terms of something that you can mine later for short stories or threads that you might want to pull on at a later date? Oh uh, yeah, sometimes there's I get ideas for little little you know minor stories that might have happened during those breaks between books or series. Um, I've had one idea for a, a short story that I wrote, which was set five years after the Trader Queen trilogy. And I wrote it initially as a short story um, for an anthology that never happened. <laughs> mm. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I was contacted by G Gardner Desoir, and he wanted a novella. And so I actually expanded it into a novella science story, which was just added fun. It was like, you know, double the fun. <laughs> and and you know, I have no trim words, so getting to expand is like a luxury. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, <laughs> I got to flesh out that, because it was actually the initial analogy, anthology that it was for was a romance anthology. It was a romance anthology where one of the characters was supposed to be um, plus size. And I had so much fun with this, with this character. She was great. Um, and expanding it into the novella meant that it was not, not so weighted on the romance side. I could actually add much more mystery to it. So there was a, you know, mystery is, it's almost a mystery, almost a crime mystery sort of thing going on in the background. So I finished the first draft of that one week before I got the news that Gardner is why I died. So, and then the anthology for that never happened. So, <laughs> yeah, I've got this. This wonderful novella that I love that I'd love to have out there. So what I'd like to do next, actually, because I'm taking a bit of a break from writing a series. Um, I, my back is not very good and my hands are not great. They need a good long rest. So in this break, I'd actually like to put together an anthology of short stories and novellas that I've, I've got about 10 that I've written already. Some of them have already been published, but you know, I've got the rights so I can, you know, the, the rights have already expired so I can put them into an anthology. And I've got about 10 other ideas that I'd need to write, I think, to, to fill it out to a good size anthology. So if, if the question is, what am I doing next? That's actually what I would like to do. Next. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to see that because I think um, sometimes those little unexamined areas of the world can be the things that are really interesting. You know, like obviously you have focus on sort of a main two characters or a main like three or four or an ensemble, mm. right? Your main characters, your supporting characters, 
your cameo characters or whatever. And sometimes you might only have one or two scenes with a character, but you really connect with them in a particular yeah. way and have an idea that you, you know, want to tap into later. So I would love to read that. I think that would be really exciting and a really nice thread between lots of different, you know, stories in your worlds. It also makes it easier. Um, I've written novellas and stories before based on the worlds I've already written it, but it, it gets hard for people to get hold of them, particularly when they're in an Australian anthology. It's a lot harder for people mm. um, overseas to get hold of them. So getting them all into one anthology would be, would be really good. People can read. There's one called The Mad Apprentice, which is the why, the reason why um, Black Magic was banned in the Guild. So there's, there's that one as well. So... Yeah. yeah, it is a little bit of an advantage when you have, um, when you get a few books in a series and you have the rules of the world very well established. It's like you get a little bit of a head start sometimes. <laughs> I'm like six yeah. books into the Supernatural Sister series, which is the series that I write. And even though each book is a different main character every time, it's the same conventions of the world and the same rules and the same type of structure. So every time you have to sit back down to write it, it, it kind of feels like you're cheating but you're not cheating on your own homework. It's very strange. Even the short story, it's like, well, I've already built everything. I've got all the, yeah. I built the way, so I just get to go play in the sandbox that I've constructed somehow. Yeah. But, I think I like about um, Sometimes stories are actually not, they, 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 they want to be of a certain size and trying to force a story to be a whole book sometimes just doesn't work. So this is a way of actually getting an episode or a, you know, a historical moment or something like that down without actually writing an entire book to do it. Yeah, totally. And it's also a good way to stretch a different storytelling muscle. Like for me, mm. I, I personally, I really struggle to write short stories. I struggle <laughs> to keep things my, like, you know, when I write a feature article for a publication, it tends to be a max, max, like 3000 words. Right. And if I'm writing a book, it's like a hundred thousand at least. So anything that is sort of in that middle range, like a short story that's 10 to 15,000, I found really hard because I'm like, wait, how do I just not make this 100,000 or how do I not make it three? So it's yeah. short stories I find really challenging, but at the same time, it's those things that you find really hard as a writer also become really important in terms of trying to flex those muscles you might use all the same. I certainly know that when I'm writing a short story, it usually gets polished far more than a chapter in a book would be and be about the same amount. So it's, it's really yeah. it's like you're compressing the, the challenge of a book down in story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel that um, very much. Um, obviously, the mark of a good writer is, well, I mean, there's a lot of marks of a good writer, but I think one of the key ones is people investing in your world and investing in your characters. And people are very invested in your worlds and your characters. And everything that you've created, the entire universe is around each of the separate trilogies, but also the combined trilogies. Um, heading into a finale like Maker's Curse, are you conscious of what the readers are saying and things that they're keen or keen not to see? Like, is that something that you're aware of? Um, I'm a little bit protected from it, um, partly because I do say on my website, if people are going to email me, then don't send me ideas. Like, don't send me story <laughs> ideas. And and it's like, I'd love to know what people's ideas are, but I know my brain, my brain would basically go, if somebody suggests it to me, then it must be predictable, so I won't do it. So if everybody gave me all their ideas, there'd be no ideas left for me to do. So I kind of, I kind of blanket myself, you know, protect myself from, from any ideas that people have. Um, the other thing too is I don't really, I don't really go into forums. Like if on Twitter and social media, people don't necessarily have in-depth sort of, um, insights that they give on what they think a character should do and things like that. I, I, but I don't haunt things like forums and stuff because I have in the past thought about going over and going to one of these and I've, I've like particularly on Reddit, they sort of said don't come in because it intimidates the fans and then they might not say what they really want to say because yeah. you, they'll write what you think. If they, want, they want to be free to say whatever they want to say without hurting your feelings. I like that someone was like politely, please don't. <laughs> Please don't yes. come in, just stay outside the digital house. And I think that's kind of fair enough, actually. You know, I, li I like people to be free um, to not be worried when I'm going to think about what they think, you know. Because in, in many ways, I, I don't mind what people think. Like, I don't expect everyone to like my books, you know. It's, it, of course, that'd be insane. No one's, not everyone's going to like my books. 
So yeah. if they have a particular gripe, I, I go and gripe somewhere. That's fine with me, you know? <laughs> yeah, art is subjective. Um, as somebody yeah. with a big, you know, international fan base and you have a lot of readers who have been on your journey and been reading your work for a long time, you know, over a decade, how do you balance um, the desire to give the readers what they want versus what they need? Um, mostly because I'm stubborn and, and pretty much I <laughs> my characters. Um, I mean, it helps that I did something to a very well loved character in my first series that I've never been forgiven for. So I don't but think that's I could actually do smart work. because I did the same thing in my first book as well. And it's <laughs> kept people on edge ever since. And it yeah. teaches readers not to be complacent because they're like, yeah. if they will kill off or whatever X, Y, Z person, then nobody is safe. So it ends up becoming yes. an advantage. Yeah. But then you're going, well, I don't want to repeat myself. So I can't do the same thing again. So are they then assured, reassured that I'm not going to do the same thing again? Yeah. But I don't really know what I'm going to do until... I not, not until I do it, but until I've actually structured out the book, and then I go, "Oh, okay, right." Because I'm a plotter; I like to have it all mostly worked out beforehand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when I'm plotting, I do sort of have in mind what what's going to make the reader feel the most. Mm. No, I don't mean feel good. You know? Yeah. <laughs> what's going to make? Yeah, that's them? that's the fine line, though. The difference between what somebody wants and and what they need. What's the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we've got a question here from Stuart Gillespie and he asks when writing a series do you know the ending from the start or do you let the characters leave you I know the ending from the start I am a thorough plotter I, I plot the entire series I plot each book I plot I even write down a little description of the scene before I write it um, but I do leave some room in there there's usually space where you can I can just sort of extrapolate, you know, the character's got to get from this A to, to B and between I can play instead of bit. But mostly I know what I know what's coming and I find that I don't really get into a story until I know what's going to happen at the end. It's like this carrot on a stick for me. The excitement of knowing what, you know, anticipating in my mind what the readers are going to think when they go, oh, when they get to that point. <laughs> With your um, artistic background, are you ever tempted to do like storyboards or like a version of that? If you're having maybe trouble writing a scene or you're trying to be very specific about something, do you ever sketch it out like physically? I tend to do more diagrams and maps and things. I had lots of little maps and things for um, the Magician Trilogy because the guild, you know, is forming what the place looked like and the, the floor plans and things like that beforehand. So, yeah, I've got sketches and I think most of them are still on my website. Um, you can gradually follow through and you find them. Um, but just a little plan of the, you know, the High Lord's residence and, and sort of which rooms and where Sonia, you know, walked and, you know, where wizards went and that sort of thing. So I don't want to give any spoilers, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's really hard. Honestly, I was prepping these questions and it's really tricky. Like, you know, you're, you're talking about the end of a series and I'm like, oh, you don't want to ruin it for people. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Uh, we got a question here from uh, Lucrezia. Question for you both, smiley face. <laughs> Do you ever struggle with insecurity and question yourself about writing? Um, yeah, I probably still do, actually. And not so much as I... It's funny, I, I reckon I'm as confident now as I was in the beginning. As in, in the beginning, I was naive, and now I'm not. Um, but at the same time, I say, it's a bit like public speaking. Initially, I was like, ignorance is bliss. I just get up there and I'd be really nervous when I get there and go, what could go wrong? I don't know. Now I know what can go wrong. So now I'm nervous. <laughs> but I also know that I can get through it and I've got answers for most questions. And if I feel prepared, then I'm fine. So it's a bit that way as well. Um, initially, when I first started writing and I wasn't published, I mean, getting published is a wonderful validation. It's like, somebody actually likes this. It must be crap. <laughs> you know, obviously, this is not crap, at least to some level, you know. Still, you know, you don't really know until the readers read it. Publishers sometimes love your work and then the readers don't. So that's also a scary thing. Um, but, yeah, even, even now, writing like my 14th, 15th book, depends if you consider the, the Doctor Who one to be a book, even though it was really tiny. Um, even now, I still get anxious as to whether the book will succeed um, because it's still 
you know, am I resting on my laurels? Like, you, you never stop questioning and you always keep raising the bar as you go along through your career. It's like, well, I've got to keep doing better because I can't rely on, you know, people, the same readers. And, and you're also aware of the fact that there's so many people who pick up your first book, you don't then go on to buy the second and third. So there's yeah. usually a tapering off over the years of people who read your work. So yeah. it's natural, but it also makes you very uneasy because you think, oh no, when is it going to get to the point where the publisher won't want to publish me anymore? <laughs> No. Yeah, it is interesting. Like when I was, I was trying to think of the best way to answer this question because I, um, I graduated high school at, at 16 and started work full time at a newspaper two days later uh, and worked as a police reporter. And I've been working full time as a writer, whether that is journalism or screenwriting or author writing simultaneously, oftentimes, like right now, I'm very stressed, um, doing all of those things full time since I was 16. So I have never really had the time to be insecure about that kind of stuff. But then as you were talking, and you were saying that thing about like people picking up your first book, and that's what I get insecure about. Because once it's done, and it's out there, it's out there, and you might be really happy with it at the time, or you might be really happy with it two years after the fact or three. But once you hit that like five year mark and you've had a book that's been in the market for five years, I'm just like, oh, you know, you just don't want to get a little too close and revisit some of the things or things you might change or perspectives you might change. Or like I wrote my first book in first person and I'm like, oh, why did I do that? I hate that. But, you know, honestly, you change and things become better for certain stories and vice versa. Um, so got another two oh. questions here. I'm conscious of the fact that we're getting towards the end. I believe we have 12 minutes to go. So we've got a question here from Susan and a question from Rebecca. So I think we answer those two and then um, Colin and I. So the question from Susan is, what comes first when writing trilogies? A character, a concept or a location? That's a good question. Hmm. Okay, the first thing that usually comes is a magic, a kind of magic, a magic system. Um, and it's like Black Magician Trilogy, it was the idea of magic being a latent power in, in a character, you know, in a person. And so if, if another person was the only one, if he relied on a teacher to actually bring that out, there was no other way of, of having magic, then the teacher's going to be very powerful. They're going to form a school. It's going to be part of the highest class in society. And then, of course, what's the most obvious thing to do then is to have a character actually naturally develop magic without it being latent with it you know and then all the problems that, that comes from that um and then in age of the five it was the idea of you know magic's everywhere but and humans can use it but most humans can only do something really small like light a candle um and but when they can do something they it can be as spectacular as being almost godlike in balance you know they can be immortal they can be they can change their ability, their age, that sort of stuff. So it was a great vast potential. But at the same time, plants and animals could use magic. So um, I found that really, really fun to then extrapolate story from. Um, Maker's Curse, the idea was the magic was outside of a person, but their ability um, depended upon their ability to their reach. So if they couldn't reach very far to pull that magic to them, they were not as strong and if they had a really distant reach they could actually gain a whole lot of magic um but because it's a multiple world scenario if you go to a world that has less magic so it's more thinly spread then you're going to be less powerful than you were in a world where it's actually quite intensely spread so the idea of the magic comes and then and even with um with maker's curse well with thief's magic the, the millennium's rule first book um the idea of tyan who um, lives, lives in a world where machines are run by magic. That came out of thinking, I went to a panel at Worldcon in Australia in um, 2010. And uh, they had a panel there about other kinds of punk than steampunk. So, you know, you've got Iron Age punk and, and you've got um, primitive punk and that sort of thing. And I started thinking, what would magic punk look like? Because I thought magic's my thing. What would magic punk look like? And of course, the magic runs the machines. So if the magic imbues the world, then the machines are using up the magic. So and that, all, that all just stimulates ideas and characters from there. I said that's the root of all my ideas. Cool. Um, we have a question here from Rebecca. She says, have you ever suffered from writer's block? And if so, how did you get through it? 
I don't suffer from writer's block. I suffer from writer's procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a different type. A different type. That's more of like writer's mm. chocolate bar rather than writer's Cadbury block. Yes. <laughs> no, I can. I can procrastinate. You know. I can, I can happily write about something completely I don't need to be writing if I have something I have to write. It's amazing how interesting other things will be if there's something that I've got a deadline for. Um, yeah, writer's procrastination. Yeah, so I can't give right, any advice on writer's block because <laughs> I don't think I've ever suffered from it. There's usually too many ideas and not enough time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think of that as well, like, because it does, that is the thing, like you can have lots of ideas for stories and books, but they take a long time to even get a really good draft and then to polish that draft to the point that it's submittable and it's just a matter of time versus idea and, you know, which one you, which one you have to prioritize, which one you're being paid for usually is, um, <laughs> is what you have to end up prioritizing, which one is going to pay my rent or vice versa. But um, I now because enjoy, I'm, oh, sorry, you go. I do have to enjoy the writing of it. So I find probably if I was thinking I had wrote a book, I would just say, just sit down, start writing, see where it goes. And just because I'm a very immersive writer, I become the character. Mm. And I think I would just think of a, a way magic could be throw a character in that situation and just start immersing myself in that character. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find myself in conversations in the heads of characters. <laughs> like yes. back and forth like I'm three of them it might be mild schizophrenia I don't know but it is that <laughs> thing of like you really get into a scene or a particular like certain characters have a pace to them the way they banter and the way they talk so you know then next thing you know you're trying to have those conversations you're like rah, 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 rah. You're like, oh I'm a crazy person great 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 um now I'm conscious of the fact that most people, this is my last question, and um, also like the time is, is, is getting to the end in there, but most people who are watching are in, are in the UK or Scotland, and Trudy and I are from Australia, and so I was wondering if you had any recommendations for people, um, whether it was an Australian author, or Australian comic book writer, or comic book artist, that is speculative fiction, you know, sci-fi or fantasy or something that people uh, you think they may enjoy. Do you have anybody that you want to give a bit of a signal boost to? Well, most recently I did an interview with, uh, I did a Q and A session um, with Devin Madsen. And I love Devin. Because I knew I was going to be reading, oh, I could be talking to her. I sat down and read a book um, and her book, uh, We Ride the Storm. It is amazing. It's really good. Um, I was really totally pleased that it was as brilliant as it is because I've been raving about it everywhere I go ever since. It is really good um, and I cannot wait for the next book and I tried to get her to give it to me but I think I have to wait. So. <laughs> I tried to bust um, a kneecap in the digital Zoom to try and get that early proof. Yeah. Another book, uh, a little bit older than that, a couple of years old now, um, Sam Hawke. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I'm doing a memory, a memory lag thing again. Ah, I'm going to have to look her up. You want to talk just for a sec? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, did you say Sam Hawke? Yeah. Yeah, um, is it Potion? Um, oh, this is going to fucking kill me. Uh, because Sam and I, we both won the Aurealis Award last year for Best Fantasy Novel. We were like a joint tie. Um, I want to say it has Poison in the title. City of Lies. There you go. Yes, okay, yeah. I completely made that up. Poison in the title. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have Poison in the title. Poison in the series title. Poison's in a series <laughs> title. Um, Poison War Saga or something like that, I think. It's really tiny. Mm -hmm. A Poison War novel. Yeah. City of Lies. It was brilliant yeah. too. And her book, is her second book, I think, is coming out soon or? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, I think it was, it's scheduled for end of this year, I believe. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It, it's definitely... Uh, writers that I'm um, going to put everything down to read as soon as the books come out. So. Yeah. And what's great about both of those women that you mentioned is um, like yourself and like myself, we all, all have all been on Supernova Pop Culture Expo, which in Australia, Australia has a bit of a case of cultural cringe for people who don't know. <laughs> New Zealand is very pro genre, but Australia, not so much. We have a lot of genre readers, but as an industry, it doesn't really support genre writers and genre institutions. So a lot of times, um, the vessel, I guess, or the platform where a lot of genre writers end up uh, reaching all of their authors are on pop culture conventions like Supernova and 
um, things like London Comic Con and stuff like that. So that's oftentimes where you come across a lot of really great authors that you mightn't otherwise find on your, in your sort of regular city festival. That reminds me of Lynette Nonny as well. We finished her yes, series. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, anything by Amy Corfman and Jay Kristoff. They are brilliant. Um, I could just keep going on. <laughs> just stand. We'll throw some links in there. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. So thank you so much to everybody who okay. tuned in. I hope it was enjoyable. Um, I hope it was insightful. I'm sure it was. Trudy's killer or filler. And um, and thank you so much thank to you. the, I believe it was five people who submitted questions. They were great yes, questions. They were super interesting. And thanks so much to uh, Chimera Festival for having the both of us. It's absolutely yes. delightful. Yes, and I love your earrings. Oh, <laughs> yes, the feminist agenda coming through, you know. So you wouldn't be able to wear these to a real festival, but a digital festival. <laughs> I know, I probably would. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I literally have. As I was saying that, I was like, who am I kidding? Um, but yeah, thank you so much for everyone tuning in. And um, I hope whatever stuff you're checking out for the rest of the weekend, I hope it's red. Thank you for being a wonderful host. <laughs>